Thank you for auditing the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who's going to be talking about the song Slither Conspiracy by RXK Nephew. Now, apparently I talk about old songs now. This song's like three years old. And uh, this was a, a suggestion of my son to sort of talk about some of these artists who are from my local area, from Rochester, the RX crew, and really break down their songs and take their songs very, very seriously, which might seem odd because the songs that have been covered are often treated as memes, as jokes. Uh, but as I've shown the last two, I think there's a lot more to study. There's a lot more to really understand. So I want to give my expertise or my way of thinking or whatever that is to help understand, you know, if these songs are memes and if they really helped, they really agitated people and got people to react, maybe it goes beyond ha ha ha, funny, funny. Uh, maybe we can figure out why it's funny. Uh, as I said in my first RxK Nephew video, I never underestimate the intelligence of somebody who makes you laugh. And so to that end, we really need to study this song, Slither Conspiracy. Now, it turns out this is like something of a prequel to the song that I studied a couple weeks ago, American Terrorist. Much like American Terrorist, it's like six minutes long, it's rambling, it's apparently just random word choices, which I'll say, of course, it's not. It's taking aim at similar biblical themes, at celebrities, it attacks friends, families, rappers. But most important, I would say, most important is this desire to attack society and everything that society might accept as good. My favorite lyric, my favorite couplet, <laughs> a pairing of two, uh, two lines is, you don't like what I said, then unsubscribe, I will stab an innocent bitch in the eyes. So the act of asking you to unsubscribe is essentially saying, I don't care about your approval. And moreover, uh, our approval is what, that's his corn, all right? That's the, that's the money that he gets. He gets money from approval, from clips, clips, clicks, clicks. <laughs> he gets money from clicks, from subscriptions, and he is saying he does not care about you. He wants to be free of your judgment to which he follows with a somewhat humorous line about stabbing someone innocent in their eyes, trying to be as shocking as possible. Of course, this is not even close to as shocking as the song will get. Now, in my study of American to Terrorist, I talked about it as an epistemological study about the theory of knowledge. But what I fundamentally did was I landed on the idea of RxK Nephew putting himself forward as a cynic. Because a cynic is fundamentally, in its definition, someone who rejects things that society tells us to want. And in our society, it's money, power, status, acceptance. It is the public rejection of those things. So it's with that in mind that I think this song, and when I'm talking about this song, I'm also talking about American terrorists. I think we can put them together in a lot of ways. I think the best way to think of RxK Nephew is as a public punk cynic in a way that goes back far, 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 and far. So I'm gonna be comparing RxK Nephew to three people. One, Diogenes the Cynic, Diogenes of, uh, who died in 323 BC in Corinth, Greece. Okay. I'm gonna be comparing him to Francois Rabelais, who was not a philosopher as much as he was an author, although a very philosophical author, who died in 1553 in Paris, France. And finally, musician Seth Putnam, who died in 2011 in Newton, Massachusetts. I'm gonna be telling you about each of these figures individually and tying them together with RxK Nephew as a way of understanding this song and its importance, the sort of the deeper bits, the parts that go beyond ha ha ha, it's funny. Now, as I've done with the last couple uh, Rx songs, it's not that you have to dismiss the beat, but that the beat is intentionally so secondary. It's a nice, airy, strange beat. It has kind of a soft, floating feel to it. It's made by someone named Stardog808. It has a nice kind of flanger sound on it. Uh, unlike American to Terrorist, it doesn't feel like it needs to reset. It feels like it can be this nice, long song, and it really works well. As far as RxK's flow and style, in my previous videos, I talked about the way that the RX crew plays around with not rhyming or rhyming with the same word. There's a lot more of that here. I think what's interesting is he has this sort of stylistic choice to start very low and muted, just with a very low voice kind of rapping. And by the end, he's emphatic and he's not quite full yelling, but he seems somewhat exasperated. And I think that gives a sort of dynamism to the entire song. 
but that's all I'm really going to say about the, the form of the song. Let's get to the content of the song, what it's actually talking about. Before I do, uh, please subscribe. I will, I promise, if you subscribe, I will not stab an innocent bitch in the eyes, okay? But if you, do, if you don't subscribe, no promises, okay? Uh, like it. Uh, comment on it. I got so many great comments uh, on, on that last video. A lot of people seem to really appreciate this kind of dialogue we can have here, or kind of a monologue uh, plus. Uh, and then if you really like the video, you can put in the comments anywhere in your comment, AVAA. Your whole comment can even be AVAA. That stands for awesome video as always. I heart every comment that says that. Uh, even if I get a lot of comments, I like to read them all. Okay, so good. There's my little pitch. Now, let's talk about these three figures. Okay, let's talk about Diogenes, Rabelais, and Seth Putnam. Let's start in the beginning with Diogenes. Now, <laughs> I swear to God, I tell, I tell you, I read all the comments. This morning, uh, I woke up at like, I don't know, six o'clock. I had to get my daughter up for school. And uh, I'm kind of bleary, and I'm in the bathroom, and I'm brushing my teeth, and I'm looking at, at my phone. And someone left a comment on the American terrorist video that said, TLDR, Neff is Diogenes. That was uh, Dusty Annis, 4593. It's like, I've been working on this video for like the last week. I had this whole concept, this whole theory. I've been going to the library, I've been looking up sources, and I'll, and like, it was like he just, he just hit the spoiler. So anyways, that's very funny. Um, there's a lot of, the thing about Diogenes is he's a very popular figure because as you will see, he's so outrageous. He's very memeable. Uh, so I've, the sources that I've been using, I mean, the Stanford uh, Dictionary of Philosophy is an online source that's very good. If you ever need anything, that's really great. But what's tricky about Diogenes is so much of what makes him important isn't what he actually lived. It was how the stories of him reflect our desire for someone like him to exist, our dreams of freedom, our concepts of, of, of what it is to be a cynic, of what it is to reject society. But nonetheless, uh, I, I did my homework. I went to my library and, and I got these works of Diogenes Laertes, who's a different guy named Diogenes, who was like 400 years, maybe hundreds of years after the original Diogenes wrote down a lot of the stories that we have. So this is the primary text. Uh, that, that I'll be I'll be referencing, but there's tons of YouTube videos. And there's tons of like articles because the thing is Diogenes is a fascinatingly hilarious figure. But again, it's it's the legend of Diogenes that interests me the most because his biography, you know, he didn't leave writings. So really, his work is primarily consisted of people talking about his life. We're talking about somebody who lived in a barrel. He just lit in a barrel. Just that's where he lived. A big, a big barrel. He just lived in a barrel in the middle of the street. He didn't believe that private functions should be private, so he would straight up take a dump while talking to you, just <laughs> right there in the street. He uh, he would masturbate in public. He would pee in public. He he literally did not care because he did not think that those conventions of what is private and public were important. So that's how his life was like his philosophy. A very famous anecdote is he just tried to live with nothing because he thought that it was ridiculous that people had stuff. So he had a, a bowl and he would drink out of that bowl. And one time he saw a little homeless kid drinking with, out of his hands in the, in the street and he smashed his, his bowl on the ground saying, ah, that kid, you know, that little kid does a better job of living simpler than I do. I told that story to my daughter and I said, you know, I bet that kid would have appreciated that bowl, <laughs> which we'll get to that later. Part of what makes Diogenes so fascinating is his relationship to money and his refusal to live in accordance to the desire of working and getting money and being a productive member of society. Which kind of goes back to that concept of you don't like what I said, then unsubscribe. Diogenes was, was uh, exiled. Like that's how his sort of career started. He was exiled because his dad basically ran like the mint that made coins and he debased currency. He made it that currency couldn't work, that like you couldn't exchange currency. <laughs> he basically like, he remember when Joker uh, like, like burned all that money? Like he burned the billions of dollars because he didn't care about it? That's essentially what he's doing here. Now, the reason that I think this relationship to money is quite interesting uh, is that even though RxK nephew, you know, when you look at pictures of him on the internet, 
Uh, he's always has stacks of money in his hands. He's always talking about how, how much money he has. It's very clear that the money doesn't matter to him. As he says in the opening lines, I'm gonna keep selling crack till I see a Bentley. I ain't never really want a Bentley. I just wanna be able to buy a Bentley. So it's really the idea of his, he doesn't want the wealth. He wants to have the ability to have the wealth. Diogenes said that God made life easy. That was his, the way that he saw it but that we make it harder for ourselves by wanting honeyed cakes and perfume. Essentially that if we didn't want Bentleys, our life would be easy. That's why Diogenes like rolled with like 10 dogs. He just hung around with the dogs. He considered himself a dog. He just, dogs were it, right? They just walked around, they pooped where they wanted, they ate when they could, and they lived simply. That God made life simple for us, but by creating a society, essentially, we're making it harder for ourselves. And that reminds me of one of my favorite comments that I got on the RxK Nephew video. I'm sorry, I got too many comments. I don't know who said this, but you can tell me in the comments and say, hey, that was my story. He said that he went to an RxK Nephew concert and RxK Nephew was throwing out so many $20 bills that he made money going to the concert. Like the fan <laughs> got so many $20 bills that he had more money than when he went in, even after having bought the ticket. So that's this concept, this idea that accruing money, accruing wealth fundamentally is not important. That even though that's the goal of rap music for a lot of people, and even though that appears to be what he's promoting, he also will, to a certain extent, voluntarily impoverish himself, which is what Diogenes did. But the most important aspect, I think, of Diogenes is his scorn. Uh, as it says in this book, on page 27, uh, he was great at pouring scorn on his contemporaries. Is there any better way of saying that RxK Nephew is great at pouring scorn on his contemporaries? Now, interestingly, sometimes, you know, this scorn will be pointed. Uh, he was, again, quoting this book, astonished that the slaves saw their masters were gluttons and they did not steal some of the meat essentially seeing the inequality and just being amazed at people not uh, acting out and fighting against the inequality of society. But really what his scorn was focused on, and what I think is the most interesting aspect of scorn, is the search for truth and for good men. Now I'm using the term good men as good people. We're living in a sexist world here. This is ancient Greece, so the term man substitutes for humanity. I'm going to continue using that term because that is the historically accurate term. However, I don't like it, <laughs> okay? In my daily life, I don't talk about man. I talk about humanity. But, so it's the search for a good man. And I think in both American Terrorist and Slither Conspiracy, fundamentally, that is what RxK Nephew is looking for as well. It's like a search for someone who is true. The, the story about, about uh, Diogenes is that he used to walk around with a lantern. And they'd say, what are you doing? And he says, I'm looking for a good man. What's implied is he never found one. One time he went to a bath and they said, oh, were there a lot of men there? And he said, no. And they said, was it crowded? And he said, yes, <laughs> because there was a lot of people there, but none of them were men in the sense of being honorable, true people. Which ties in to this concept of conspiracy. Because conspiracies the song, again, it's called Slither Conspiracy. The cover has all sorts of conspiracies. We'll talk a lot about it. But it's the search for truth, fundamentally. It's a misguided search for truth. It's, it's searching for truth and finding fiction that reflects some truth. I'll say that again. A conspiracy theory is someone searching for the truth, finding fiction that reflects some aspect of truth. So Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster... Nature is incomprehensible, okay? Neither of those things exist. I've been to Inverness multiple times. There is no Loch Ness. But our search for the vastness, the incomprehensibility of nature is reflected in the fact that those things can exist. Who killed JFK? Oswald. That was it. It's 
case closed. We're done. But the, the, the greater truth that the CIA is shady, that the FBI is shady, that the government is shady, that's a deeper truth that's, revo- that's evolved. You know, when people are looking for conspiracies, they're trying to get to truths. COVID-19 is a real thing, and it was terribly handled, uh, but the conspiracy behind it fundamentally is our lack of faith in public health. 9-11, we know who did it. Of course, America was partly complicit in 9-11, but uh, not because Bush did it or it was an inside job, but because of our foreign policy, <laughs> okay, because of the corruption of our administration. And finally, the 2020 election, uh, while it's not true, all the things that, that, uh, that Giuliani and, and Trump says, it is true that we do not, that our democracy does not really reflect the will of the people. So when we're, Confronted with conspiracy theories, that's the way I think we need to think about it. We need to imagine that at the other end of of the person who's looking for the conspiracy is someone who's trying to hold the lamp and trying to find some sort of truth, but ends up finding some kind of falsehood. In Arik's case example, the primary thing he's looking for is a real rapper. Okay? Now, he's trying to find essentially a real man. Now, in American to Terrorist, uh, I put forth that their only real people were Jesus and Joe Budden. In this song, I think it's really only King Vaughn, who he mentions over and over again, uh, as someone who he messes with, as somebody who is like noble, somebody who had value, somebody who is a successful murderer. But for the rest of the song, he's just holding up his lamp and looking at other rappers like French Montana or Rick Ross, who was a prison guard, or a Kanye, who's into Analingus, apparently. Even his friend, Rx Poppy, who's apparently a snitch, according to this song. Someone, Black Youngsta, who's incomprehensible. Lil' Kim, who's bad. Cardi B, who's bad. Designer sounds like Future, and Future isn't even a real druggie. Goes even further back. I heard James Brown sniff coke. <laughs> that is not. Listen, James Brown is one of my favorite musicians. Uh, maybe I'll do a video sometime about why James Brown is great. Uh, but the, the video of him high on coke is, is objectively hilarious. You can find it on YouTube. You know, Lil Yachty, how'd he get his name if he didn't have a yacht? And even Joe Budden. And this song is kind of a, he's a crackhead in this song. And then, of course, Migos end up becoming one of the primary targets. Because why? RxK Nephew is putting himself forth as a real deal crack dealer criminal. So people who fake that, as he claims the Migos do, are therefore the most phony. The people who are, are the least men underneath the lantern. It goes on to fake dreads, Lil Durk and Fetty Wap, and attacks Waka Flocka Flame, who it turns out is not the same person as Wiz Khalifa. If you saw my, uh, if you saw my Nicki Minaj video, you'll understand why that's funny. So I thought, that, <laughs> I, thought I got myself water, <laughs> but this is just straight black coffee. You can also buy my mug if you want. I'm not recording my usual place because uh, my baby's downstairs and moving around. You know, all these rappers move like 6 9 So we have essentially the, the poles, right? The poles of realness. We have King Vaughn and 6 9 One of my favorite, just by the way, just one of my favorite disses uh, from Diogenes. <laughs> uh, he was quoted as saying something like kind of stupid when he was younger. <laughs> And this is what he said. Again, this is according to the transcription. No, page 59. That was... The, so, okay, so someone says, didn't you say this stupid thing? Ah, that was the time when I was such as you are now. But such as I am now, you will never be. So, I, I don't... Uh, you know, essentially what he's saying is, yeah, I wasn't as real uh, as I am now, but as real as I am now. That was... That was back when I was as fake as you, but as real as I am now, your fake ass will never be. That's essentially what he's saying. Now, of course, he also goes back and attacks Will Smith. So both these songs attack Will Smith and his sexuality. He attacks people for dressing up like Medea. He attacks uh, a rapper for um, uh, being attracted to or having sex with, uh, I guess, the Teasler. Is that the term that we use now? now, a thing that happens, and I just, I just want to be careful, okay, because anachronism uh, is a bitch, okay? So <laughs> anachronism is when you uh, don't understand historical realities and you sort of 
pretend like people were in the past the way they are now, right? So Diogenes is like this great, cool, cool guy, hero, all that stuff. Um, but interestingly, he was also quite, uh, he, has a, he has a quote which can be seen as being anti-trans. 67 off of uh, the Laertes book, seeing young men behaving effeminately, are you not ashamed that your own intention about yourself should be worse than nature's? For nature made you a man, but you are uh, fixing yourself to play the woman. I mean, you know, sounds like that uh, that Crowder guy, right? <laughs> Anyways, uh, so there's some similarities there. Another aspect that I think makes this song very Diogenes-like, Diogenetic, I don't think that's a word. I don't even know what I'm gonna call this. Anyways, is the relationship to power. So one of the most gangster things, punk things about Diogenes was his interactions with Alexander the Great. If you don't know Alexander the Great, he was one of the most powerful people in the history of humanity, conquered huge swaths of the ancient world, and he was called I am Alexander Great. So again, this whole story, we don't know what's apocryphal, meaning we don't know what really happened versus what was written afterwards. The story is more important than the reality, so I'm not interested in finding the reality. You can read Plutarch, you can read all sorts of stuff about what really happened. This is the story as I understand it. Alexander the Great, the most powerful man in the world, hears of Diogenes, this great philosopher who's weird and takes poops in public and lives in a barrel. Diogenes is sitting there and he's laying in the sun. He's like a dog, right? You ever see a dog laying in the sun? You know that kind of happiness and contentedness? That's the way Diogenes was. Alexander the Great walks up and says, I am Alexander the Great. To which Diogenes responds, I am Diogenes the dog. It's worth mentioning that the word cynic and dog are essentially the same. The word cynic comes from the word dog. Anyways, Alexander says to Diogenes, I can grant you any wish you, you would like. You know, I have all this power. I will give you anything. What would you like, O oh great philosopher? To which Diogenes responds, I would like you to move. You're blocking the sun. Okay? <laughs> Most powerful man in the world. And he just treated him like nothing. Because that was the thing about Diogenes. He treats everyone poorly. There is a quality in the world of Diogenes, which is that everyone is treated like nobody. He called himself a dog. <laughs> He called himself a dog that everyone admired, but no one wanted to go hunting with, which I think is a very beautiful idea, right? Like everyone, like, kind of like Arx K Nephew, you know, like, ah, oh, he's so awesome. I just, oh, geez, though, I'm friends with him. He's telling me he's going to rob me. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I actually want to hang out with that. Anyways, the story goes on. Alexander the Great is so impressed by being confronted, right? Because Alexander the Great is an interesting guy. I don't think he's inherent. Well, anyways, I'm not going to do it. Uh, 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 eulogy of Alexander the Great, but he's impressed by this response. And he says this, truly, if I were not Alexander the Great, I would wish to be Diogenes. To which Diogenes responded, if I were not Diogenes, I would also wish to be Diogenes. <laughs> Just absolute <laughs> savagery, right? So this is the idea that everyone is equal to the scorn, that he held up the, the, the lantern to even the most powerful man in the world and saw that he was lacking and treated him like he was lacking. So I think that's why he takes aim at both the 46th, 45th president and 46th president, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. I mean, he makes a couple references to himself as walk in the trap like Donald Trump, Big Neff, make the trap great again. I think his support of Donald Trump is intentionally being provocative. I think he knows most of his audience doesn't like Trump, and so he's doing it. We can call it a troll, but I think it's more. I think he is taking the cynic's position that everything that is good in society, questioning it and putting it up for scorn. All Joe Biden's votes was fake. They say Donald Trump should have won again. I should punch that N-word in his shit. Oh, the best. This line. So who? Who should he punch in his shit? <laughs> right? First of all, doesn't rhyme. Uh, none of that rhymes. <laughs> uh, but who should he punch in the shit? Is it Trump or Biden? Or both? Because fundamentally, neither of these people really support or help him or represent him. And he's just kind of throwing out these ideas. He's 
buying into a conspiracy theory, again, I believe to be repugnant to polite society, while at the same time, he is directly confronting the President of the United States and saying he should punch that N-word in his shit. There have been a lot of, there have been a lot of songs about, and a lot of rap lyrics about presidents, right? My personal favorite is from Bismarck Key. Reagan is the prez, but I voted for Shirley Chisholm. But this is one of the best because it takes a swipe at two presidents and it's violent and it's unclear exactly who he's talking about. Everyone is equal under this lamp. Another aspect that I would say ties together Diogenes and RxK Nephew is the idea of insanity. Now, amazingly, <laughs> Diogenes like went after Plato. Like Plato and Diogenes had scuffles and like intellectual fights, right? And they called each other out in hypocrisy. It's pretty pretty magical, the, the world of ancient Greece. Uh, when Plato was asked about Diogenes, he said he was Socrates gone mad, which I think is a beautiful idea of the pinnacle of intelligence of right? Like literally the smartest, wisest human being in the history of civilization, Socrates, gone mad. And this song is a lot about being mad. She like, babe, I love you, but you too crazy. I'm like, shit. I'm like, shut the fuck up. You ain't seen crazy. I really been on them beans lately. I assume that means pills. All over the song, he talks about his insanity. That's part of why he has the flow that he has or the non-flow that he has or he keeps rhyming the same words or he keeps saying the same things. He's trying to project this concept of absolute insanity. But it's a kind of practiced, performed insanity because in a world in which everything that is held up as good is not. And reason is one of those things that we hold up as good. Being reasonable is perhaps an improper philosophical position. It is perhaps more morally correct to be crazy and unreasonable in a world in which reason has led us to such obscenity and pettiness as the world that we live in. You see? He's not crazy. He's a philosopher. Another aspect that, that permeates this and permeates American terrorist is a kind of praise of ignorance. And this is where we go back to the idea of conspiracy theories, because conspiracy theories are born out of ignorance. Again, going back to, and this is this has been fun because um, some of the, you know, like when I, I watched a lot of the, the YouTube um, scholarship on Diogenes, and it's all basically the same things over and over again. It was interesting kind of digging into this. It's actually volume two. Yeah, this is volume two. Um, where on page 75, it says, Diogenes held that we should neglect music, geometry, astronomy, and studies like that as useless and unnecessary. So, I mean, right? I mean, if you remember the previous song where he talks about astronomy, about how many stars there are, that if we have this world where things are so uneven and unequal and insanity rules and reason is held up, but in reality, reason doesn't serve anything, then this concept of knowledge and mastery is perhaps itself not something to be aspired to. Now that is at, at odds with Rabelais, who I'll talk about in a second, who said that ignorance is the mother of all evil, uh, but it is in line with Seth Putnam, who wrote a song once called Being Ignorant is Awesome. But conspiracy theories, really they breed in ignorance because it's the lack of, like, it's knowing that there's a truth, but lacking the education, experience, curiosity and like lack of gullibility you know that like you know there's something but you don't know what it is and so that's where conspiracy theories come in and that's that's why the 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 dialogue around conspiracy theories is so frustrating <laughs> because it's like hey the government did totally screw up the, the COVID response. But it's not because the whole thing was faked in a lab. It's because, uh, you know, commercial interests outweighed the need to keep people alive, right? Like just, you know, th there is a truth there, but we don't quite get there. And so what is the song's relationship to conspiracy theories? Is it for them? Is it against them? I mean, if, if we look at the actual album cover, right, it, it seems like it's intentionally quite silly. Okay, we have the Sphinx, we have Michael Jackson holding a baby, we have Prince, we have Masonic symbols, we have Area 51, the 9-11 Towers, we have Tupac. 
you know, it seems like it's kind of a kind of a trolling, uh, kind of a trolling album cover. I mean, we think about his actual presentation of conspiracy theories. You know, he goes through. You know, Neil Armstrong never walked on the moon. He can't do that Michael Jackson move. This is where I think it gets really interesting, because he's ironically putting forth a conspiracy theory. So he's someone who puts forth the value of ignorance pretty consistently and who downplays the importance of education and sort of, uh, much like Diogenes, have downplays very smart people telling you what things are. People like me, when I teach you how to conjugate verbs in French, right? But the argument that he's making, <laughs> Neil Armstrong never walked on the moon because he couldn't do Michael Jackson's dance, is very clearly saying that's, uh, that is actually... As, you know what? That is the best argument for why we didn't land on the moon. That Neil Armstrong couldn't dance like Michael Jackson. Okay? If anyone ever tells you that the moon landing was fake, jump in and say, Oh, yeah, you know what? You know what, though? That's true. Because Neil Armstrong can't do the moonwalk. That's perfect. Same thing when he says, I think this whole pandemic was fake. COVID-19 was a fake. I'm coughing because of these white runts. I, there's some kind of blunt or something, some kind of thing you smoke, drug deal. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever runs are, uh, I don't smoke them. Not that I have anything wrong with, with whatever they are. I, I associate runs as these little candies that I used to get that were like shaped like fruit. Those I messed with. I messed up my teeth. <laughs> I messed up my teeth because of bana banana runs. The runs that taste like banana, one of the best candies in the world. So this is absurd. But what he's doing is he is actually making an anti-conspiracy theory song by satirically, ironically putting forth these conspiracy theories. Essentially, if you hear the song and you go, oh yeah, COVID, if you think COVID-19 was fake or was a hoax or in any way was a conspiracy, then this song puts forward such a stupid defense of that idea that you therefore have invalidated the conspiracy itself, just like with the moon landing. Just because I have to, because I have to keep you guys cultured, okay? I have to keep you cultured. There is a specific word, which, a specific moment in pop culture from the TV show Living Color. There's a beautiful sketch where uh, it's like an I Love Lucy sketch. Anyways, there's a whole point where a guy talks about a conspiracy. And this is the way I think. Every time I hear a conspiracy theorist talk, this goes on in my head. There's a conspiracy out there. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? There's a conspiracy. A C O N spiracy. <laughs> okay, so so there's a conspiracy out there. You know what I'm saying? There's a conspiracy. A C O N spiracy. <laughs> so that idea, that joke. I think is at the heart of this song as well. And I don't know if he knows that sketch or not, but the fact that someone is so certain, someone who's in a menial position working in a factory and knows that something is wrong and has enough intelligence to recognize that the world that's presented to him is not accurate, but doesn't have the intelligence to even spell the word conspiracy. That's why the reaction of David Allen Greer there is so great, where he's like, mm, right? Like, what are you talking about? And that's how I feel. When I hear people talk conspiracy theories to me, I just hear them say, it's a conspiracy. C-O-N, spiracy. And I think that's what this song is. A final word on Diogenes. It's so much fun talking about Diogenes. Uh, <laughs> We don't actually know how he died. Uh, even even, in, even in, in this, they give three different stories. One, he ate some uh, bad octopus and died. Uh, two, some dogs bit him when he was sharing his raw octopus with them. Or three, he just decided he would die because he was tired of living and held his breath until he dropped dead. The last one is obviously the best, so I'm going to go with that one. But what he requested was, when he die, be thrown into the woods outside the city so that animals can eat him because that way he can be of service to them the way they were of service to him. When Slitherman die, don't send me flowers. If you put me in a pack, better be some rapper, right? So when he dies, he doesn't want any recognition. Just wet, wet mud, right? He just wants to be gone. He doesn't care. 
in the very similar sense, <clears throat> a sort of cynical, a cynical approach to death is that the conventions that we have around it with all sorts of fancy, I was, I was, we were talking about this at dinner yesterday, you know, and we're talking about the American conventions of death. It actually would make a lot more sense, truly, if we were just thrown into the woods to be eaten by animals, right? What's, I don't know. I don't know that I'm being eaten by animals and that I'm dead. Okay, so let's, now that we're done with, uh, with uh, Diogenes, we'll, we'll come back to Diogenes here. But let's move on to Francois Rabelais, okay? Uh, the middle figure there. Uh, let me talk a little bit about this book, Le Tire Livre. So, the reason I invoke him is, first of all, he's one of my favorite figures, and if I can get anybody to think about Francois Rabelais, okay, who died in the 1530s, but <laughs> he basically... He wrote so much about drinking and fucking, like so much about dicks and farting. And the thing was, he didn't do it just to be funny. He did it in the context of the Renaissance. He was a writer of the Renaissance and it was all about humanism and the glory of humanity. The first paper I ever got published in an academic journal was entirely about a chapter in which a character describes how he learned how to wipe his own ass. Because everybody in Rabelais, uh, the main characters here, are all giants. And so he learns to wipe his ass, and he goes through like 30 different things. Actually, more than that. And then he finally lands on a well-plumed goose. And that's how he wipes his ass. And I wrote a whole paper about how the goose is what you use to make a pen, and that essentially wiping your ass is the same thing as writing in the world of Rabelais. But it's, it's fascinating. Okay, I mean, he has chapters about like constructing city walls made entirely out of like disembodied vaginas. Ugh. The thing is, is that much like Diogenes, he sort of lived in this way. He wrote in a certain way where he was trying to hold up a lantern, see how fake everybody was. He was constantly calling out society and he was living outside the bounds of society and putting forth a world in which it's like... <laughs> the rules that we all accept might not be the good rules. In particular, I'm thinking of the way that he starts off uh, most of his prefaces in a similar way. Like at the beginning of his book, Gargantua, he starts, and I'll translate it here for you, my most illustrious drunkards and you precious syphilitics, it is to you that I write and not to others. That's my rough translation, but he's saying right off the bat that he's not writing for fancy, smart-ass people like me. He's writing for people who are drunks and who have syphilis because they have too much sex. I'm going to drink this henny till I fuck up my kidney. That's the opening line to this song, a very similar idea of putting this forward. And also, Rabelais had a lot of fun po poking holes in the Bible. He would make little jokes about the Bible, like about Noah and uh, Adam and Eve for that matter. Uh, in this song, what's interesting is we have our XK nephew discussing how the Bible made me hate a bitch, talking about how the Bible made Eve, quote, trifling. Uh, and that's fascinating because that answers my question from the previous song where I talked about the misogyny and this is actually answering the question that it is actually holding a light up to the Bible and saying that the Bible itself is ridiculous, right? And then there's the style, there's a style, right? Which is a style of excess. This six minute song, American Terrorist is so long and the, and the rhymes are coming and the rhymes don't come. There's a thing that happens where you go, oh my God, this is, this is, this is kind of funny. Oh, this is going on too long. Come on, this is too long. <laughs> Actually, you know what though? It's kind of funny that it's going on this too long. I could have also brought in Austin Powers, that whole, that whole uh, movie series is based on this idea that there's something funny, and Family Guy does this as well, a lot, where something's funny, and then you keep doing it, and it's not funny, and then it gets to be funny again. It's this excess. Uh, I point out the Tier Livre by Rabelais, because he opens up the entire book with a story about Diogenes. And it's a story about how uh, he was there in Athens and everyone was getting ready for war. And he goes over a hundred things that the people of the town prepare for the war. Like just as an example, I'm, I'm going to be uh, using uh, Cromarty and, and Motu's, uh translation here because it's impossible to translate because it's like hundreds and hundreds of weird words. 
but how the people of the town prepared spears, stakes, pikes, brown bills, halberds, long hooks, lances, zagays, quarter staves, eel spears, partisans, trout saves, clubs, battle axes, mazes, darts, dartlets, glaives, javelins, javelos, and truncheons. They set edges upon scimitars, cutlasses, battleers, back swords, tucks, rapiers, bayonets, arrowheads, dags, daggers, madusin, poignard, winyards, knives, skeins, shables, chipping knives, and rallyants. He just goes on and on and on like this. And so in response to this, Diogenes thinks. He sees everybody around him doing all this work to prepare for war. And he goes to the top of a hill and brings his barrel. And I, 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 <laughs> I'm going to be cutting this down. These are the things that he does to his barrel. Did he turn it, veer it, wheel it, whirl it, frisk it, jumble it, shuffle it, huddle it, tumble it, hur hurry it, jolt it, jostle it, overthrow it, Evert it, invert it, subvert it, overturn it, beat it, thwack it, bump it, batter it, knock it, thrust it, push it, jerk it, sock it, shake it, toss it, throw it, overthrow it, upside down, topsy-turvy, arsiturvy, tread it, trample it, stamp it, tap it, ting it, ring it, tingle it, towel it, sound it, resin it, sap, stop it, shut it, unbung it, close it, unstopple it, and then again, in a mighty bustle, he bandied it, slubbered it, hacked it, witted it, weighed it, darted it, hurtled it, staggered it, reeled it, swinged it, brangled it, tottered it, lifted it, heaved it, transformed it, transfigured it, transposed it, transplaced it, reared it, raised it, hoised it, washed it, dighted it, cleansed it, rinsed it, nailed it, settled it, fastened it, shackled it, fettered it, leveled it, blocked it, tugged it, toot it, carried it, bedashed it, betrayed it, parched it, mounted it, broached it, nicked it, notched it, bespattered it, decked it, adorned it, trimmed it, garnished it, gauged it, furnished it, bored it, pierced it, trapped it, rumbled it, slid it down the hill and participated from the very height of the hill. Okay, so that's the style. Did you get tired of it? Were you getting annoyed? And then did you kind of think it was funny that I kept going? It's that kind of, even the general convention of how to write, how to win the goodwill of your audience. There's an intentional desire to aggravate to enrage and amuse the listener. My favorite thing is at the end of this whole story, they ask Diogenes, you know, why, <laughs> why did you do all this? We're all preparing for war and you are messing around with your barrel for literally no reason. So what he said was, oh, though I be rid from fear, I am not void of care. Listen, I, I know, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe in tattoos, right? I don't have any tattoos. Um, not a fan. Uh, bell bottoms you can't take off. But this is a pretty gangster, ta a pretty gangster tattoo. <laughs> Though I be rid from fear, I am not void of care. Meaning that the things in the world that people fear, war, death, poverty, being mistreated, being forgotten, being hungry, being thirsty, being cold. He has no fear of any of the things that drive us to war, that drive us to fight, that drive us to work. No fear. He has no fear, but he takes great pains to tell us he is not void of care. He cares about what he does, but what he does is not in keeping with what society expects him to do. And I would argue, in a very similar way, that is how our XK nephew is behaving. Okay, let's get to our third here. Now, those of you who know who Seth Putnam is, y'all been having fun with me not saying the name of his band. Because listen, if I say it in the first 10 minutes or whatever, I'm gonna get like uh, demonetized. So um, I'm gonna show you uh, his album cover. So the name of the band is uh, Anal Cunt. Uh, and you can't, <laughs> most of it's not on streaming. He's sort of a king of the pre-internet edgelords. There's a lot of pre-internet edgelords, and he was the king of it. Seth Putnam, the lead singer, died probably from doing too much crack. Probably. And heroin and stuff. He was anti-everything. He would get into fistfights with his audience. He would hit them with microphone stands. He was... According to people who I know who met him, an actual asshole in real life. <laughs> Just a very, very unpleasant guy. And this was his dedication. This was what he gave to the world. Again, I'm, I'm going to quote, uh, he died in 2011 from those reasons that I said. I don't know why. I don't know why, but those are the reasons I heard. 
Uh, Radiotangra.com is kind of an okay metal rock site. And this was, I think, the best way to describe it. And I'm going to be describing Seth Putnam for you. But as you hear, I think I could be describing Rabelais, Diogenes, and R.S.K. Nephew. Seth Putnam is best known for his uncompromising dedication to creating hideous, atonal, and brutal noise music that featured lyrics designed to piss off and offend as many people as possible. Still coffee. So I'm, I'm going to read you <laughs> some of the titles from, from these albums. Okay? Uh, trigger warning. He's racist. Very, very in favor of domestic violence. He's sexist. He's homophobic. He's violent. He's cruel. He encourages violence against all manner of people. He encourages all bigotries, all prejudices that are possible. Oh, sorry. So uh, this is how many tracks are on each album. They're like 30 seconds long each. And that's all like... <laughs> then the next song... Okay, that's all it is. So this one has 52 tracks on it. I'm just going to read you some of them. You've got no friends. You own a store. Which is a great one because it's essentially attacking sort of bourgeois values. You got date raped. You got cancer. You're a cop. Recycling is gay. The internet is gay. Being a cobbler is dumb. Your kid is deformed. Okay? He's punching up, punching down, punching all over the place. Okay? Being, <laughs> being a cobbler is dumb? <laughs> a couple years later, he'd release a very similar album called It Just Gets Worse. And here are the attacks. And this is where I'm going to kind of tie them in a little bit to RSK Nephew, you know? I mean, he tries to say the most repugnant things he could. Right? The opening track on this album is I became a counselor so I could tell rape victims they asked for it. It's horrible. It's kind of deep in a way because he's again doing this sort of satire thing where he's saying the most outrageous thing possible. It's maybe asking you in our society and in our world, is that not actually what we tell most victims? Anyways. But uh, perhaps most amusingly is his attacks on celebrities. This is where I think he really fits into RxK Nephew, who's going on looking for a real person and making fun of Lil Dirt. Like, I could easily imagine this entire, this entire song just being a series of anal cunt songs, you know? Just being a song called, like, Lil Dirk Has Fake Dreads, you know? Uh, <laughs> Kanye Gets His Ass Licked. Kanye Gets His Ass Licked! Right? <clears throat> so there's uh, Easy e Got AIDS from Freddie Mercury. Uh, and then one which is particularly brutal. So Eric Clapton is probably my least favorite artist in humanity. I really dislike him. Uh, but I don't, I'm not happy that his kid uh, fell out of a window. Um, but, but he wrote a song called Your Kid Committed Suicide Because You Suck. So he's really going after it. He's really, really going after it. Uh, deadbeat dads are cool. Domestic violence is really, really, really funny. I convinced you to beat your wife on a daily basis. Women, colon, nature's punching bags. It keeps on going and going and going. And again, I'm, I'm thinking of all the, all the domestic violence lyrics in RSK Nephew. You know, my bitch said stop popping beans. I'm like, shut the fuck up, I'll slap you, ho. Shut the fuck up, I'll rob you, ho. Right? This outrageousness. Sometimes it's about animals. I ate your horse. I sold your dog to a Chinese restaurant. Uh, again, he's really just trying as hard as he possibly can to be outrageous. Amazingly enough, there's basically the same line in this as there is in our RxK Nephew song. Seth Putnam, on the anal cunt, it just gets worse, has a song called Kick a Pregnant... I'm, I'm sorry. You're pregnant, so I kicked you in the stomach. RxK Nephew says kick a pregnant bitch in the stomach with Tim's, you don't like what I said, then unsubscribe. Tying together the previous line that I said and this line. Sorry, just you might not ever get to see his, his inside art, but it's absolutely repugnant. Just constantly, constantly trying to, trying to be as offensive uh, as possible. And, and it's this whole concept of insanity uh, and brilliance, uh, you know, like... like He's just so crazy. He's attacking everybody. A lot of his songs will even like mention his friends and attack them. And what I, what I want to do is I want to put it in the context of this. That like 
what he's saying is so outrageous, much like RxK nephew. It's offense, like what they are saying is not stuff that they mean, but they mean to offend. And by offending, they force us to question our own societal values. So that's the idea. So when RxK nephew talks about blowing up a school bus, he doesn't actually mean blowing up a school bus, but he's offending us on purpose to make us question our values. Also, <laughs> you know, it's humor, right? RxK nephew is funny. I'm talking about Phil and Lil <laughs> and Rugrats, you know? It's childishly funny, much like Seth Putnam. And once again, we get to just the absolute absurdity of everything. You know, that Donald Trump is black, right? <laughs> of all the different kinds of uh, all the different kinds of weird conspiracy theories that he can say it really is as though he is just trying to continue this tradition and just say something as crazy and as unhinged as possible <clears throat> the only anal cunt that i'm positive is on all streaming services is actually an album that comes in between these two and leads to a larger point i never thought i'd get to talk about them on this channel this this in depth so it makes me happy um is this album, Picnic of Love. So Picnic of Love is all, it's not noise rock, it's an acoustic guitar. Uh, this is the inside art for that, okay? It's acoustic guitar and him singing in falsetto, okay? It's songs like this. I respect your feelings as a woman and a human. Waterfall wishes. I couldn't afford to buy you a present, parentheses, so I wrote you this song. That is him sort of lowering the mask and showing that this whole thing is performance art, that obviously he doesn't believe these things. He doesn't believe I respect you as a woman and a human and any more than he believes that domestic violence is really, 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 really funny. He's artistically showing the, the fakeness and the falseness, he's once again holding up the lantern and showing that he can do that just as much as he can do anything. So he knows what he's doing, and I think RxK Nephew knows what he's doing as well. But in order to really put a, a final note on all three of these people, is to really draw an important distinction between RxK Nephew, Diogenes, Rabelais, and Seth Putnam. They all come from privilege. Their rejection of society comes from a place of dominance in that society, a pre-existing place of power that they are rejecting. It is a philosophical response, right? It is a, a thought experiment of intentional poverty, okay? Diogenes, his dad basically ran the mint of Sinope. Sinope? I don't know how we say it in English. Rabelais' dad was like a lawyer, and he like went on to be like a like a doctor. Seth Putnam is from Newton, Massachusetts, which is like a nice suburb of Boston. Okay, that 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 these people come to this position from a position of strength with something of a safety net of knowing the fact that they come from a place in society which values them and will recompense them. Whereas RxK Nephew grew up in a broken household, surrounded by poverty and crime, in a highly segregated country, in a highly segregated city, where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So, you know, they're looking for truth and they're questioning society in relative comfort. RxK Nephew is not. When Diogenes gave up his wealth, he had wealth to give up. When RxK Nephew throws out $20 bills, like those are $20 bills he didn't have growing up. I think we can see this in the representation of education. You know, Diogenes uh, was taught by uh, the first great cynic. He would go on to teach other people. Rabelais was a, was a preacher, was, like a, was like, a, like a priest and a doctor. Even Seth Putnam was a tutor in his high school because he was such a good student. We compare that to the way that education system is presented in RxK Nephew, Teacher said I wouldn't make it far, that dumbass hoe was probably right. Think about the world that's being presented to RxK Nephew in a very, very mismanaged public school system, in a very segregated public school system, 
in which he was told he wouldn't be anything. Diogenes was told he would be great. Rabelais was told he would be great. Seth Putnam was told he would be great. Arx Kenefi was told he wouldn't make it far. And he actually, <laughs> that dumbass hoe was probably right. Usually when people say this, you know, this teacher said I'd never make it and here I am. He's saying the opposite. Fundamentally, it boils down to a relationship of dependence and independence. The, the goal of all four of these figures is to be independent of society's rules, free of society's rules, to see what society's rules are and just take a dump on them, okay? To pee on them, okay? To jack them. Who cares? Whatever it is, they don't want those rules. They want to be free of it. That's why reading them, that's why hearing the stories of Diogenes is so exciting, that's why listening to R.S.K. Nephew is so exciting, why reading Rabelais, it's this feeling of all of us who are in the society feeling this sense of freedom and that we can just be free to just right there in the middle of a conversation you're having with a colleague at work, just cop a squat, take a dump right there in the hallway and walk away. But that's not actually the world that RxK Nephew comes from. And I think that's where the number one theme in this whole song, the most recurrent theme, is the stimulus check. Because the world that he lives in, because he doesn't grow up with privilege, because he grows up in this very unequal society, he is constantly dependent on things like a stimulus check, which COVID devastated the economy, devastated people's lives, especially if people were already in a financially precarious situation, it just made it worse. So this crumb from the government makes us dependent on the government, right? This is part of the reason why people rebel against it, because they don't like the feeling of being dependent. And the stimulus check comes to represent this dependence on society and on culture. Everybody think that stimulus coming again. I'm still waiting on auntie's stimulus check. I'm still waiting on unk's stimulus check. They say Donald Trump ain't president no more, so nobody getting a stimulus check. Unk owe me money out his stimulus check. Aunt owe me money out of her stimulus check. So there's this whole like uh, construction where it starts off with you know his aunt and his uncle who are waiting for money, and he's waiting for them to get their money because they owe him money. This poverty is absolutely everywhere. Then in the middle, we had this conspiracy theory about Trump being responsible for stimulus checks, which, you know, whatever. Yeah, I guess he signed the checks, right? But whatever, any president would have done that in that situation, doesn't matter who they are. I done robbed a mm for a stimulus check, about to rob another mm for a, sim for a stimulus check. The, the whole time, this whole economy is based around what are we going to get from society that <laughs> because society has failed them so much, they are more dependent on its handouts. As the song ends, we have a revisit to this theme. And it's an interplay of independence and dependence. I don't give a fuck about no views. I don't give a fuck about no shoes. First of all, views, right? So views meaning he doesn't care about how many people see his work. He doesn't care about how much money he gets from it. He is independent of the demands of the market. He is independent of society. RxK Nephew does not need money or approval or anything. He is living in a barrel in the middle of the city, making rhymes, and he doesn't care. But that's not how he ends it. I don't give a fuck about no shoes. Shoes representing luxury. Right? Remember Diogenes told us that the gods give us everything we need to be happy, but we just want stuff like perfume and honeyed cakes. Like little Debbie, <laughs> okay? Auntie got her first stimulus, but she's sad because it ain't too. It ends with this last line of the material conditions under which the rest of his family lives. And we're stuck down there. A final word on the song is uh, on crack. He raps a lot about crack, and I'm trying to figure out exactly why, exactly what is he getting at. And I think what it is, is it's an equalizer. When we talk about dependence and independence, crack is the great dependent, right? Like People who smoke crack are addicted to crack, and it's a very, very, very strong addiction. So I think in this little bit here, he's sort of holding up the lantern again, but really just sort of, it's almost like praise for the power of crack, for the dependency that it creates. 
how the fuck mm, say crack don't sell? Lindsay Lohan smoked crack. Amy Winehouse smoked crack. Lamar Odom smoked crack. DMX smoked crack. Cat Williams smoked crack. So it goes through different celebrities, black and white, male and female, who are famous and who smoked crack, thereby equalizing them in their state of dependence. Dave Chappelle don't smoke crack. A lot of rich ones don't smoke, smoke crack. How do you think Fat Joe loses fat? Everybody knows you lose weight, you, you smoke crack. If I get in the industry, I'm selling crack. All them Disney kids, Disney Channel kids smoke crack. Trap House look like a high school musical. The whole house in this bitch smoke crack. Everybody get high, then go to singing. So there's this great equalizer where from DMX to Disney Channel, this substance creates this dependency and equalizes us all. The issue with the difference in their, in their, up, in their life Right? The crack epidemic is something that none of these people faced. He smoked crack, but didn't live. The crack epidemic did not touch Newton, Massachusetts. Okay, <laughs> I can tell you that much. Okay. Um, the like this leads to a different outlook because if they have this view that people are weak and people are frail and people are stupid, that's fine. You know, but it comes from this position of power and a position of success. The bleakness of RxK nephew is the really sad bit, because he's growing up miserable. Terrorist act, blow up a school bus, suicide threat, kill myself. So much dirt, hard to deal with myself. Smoke a backwood, want to kill myself. Every day I want to break a bitch jaw. We see how he, this anger that he has at society the anger that he has at himself, the dirt that he had to do, which again is dirt that he had to do, presumably because of the inequality in the world that surrounded him, makes him want to kill himself. This kind of anger, this kind of very visceral self-hatred comes from the inequality in, un, under which he was born and which is not reflected in their lives. So in a way, he's kind of more badass than that. Because, you know, if you grow up with money and you throw out... If you grow up with money and then you renounce your wealth, that's one thing. If you come from poverty and become wealthy and then renounce your wealth, that's a whole other thing. Okay, so there it is. There's my third video on RX, on the RX crew, RXK nephew, uh, Slither Conspiracy. These are my Patreons. They help support me. Uh, on Patreon, I actually ask if people would like a special shout-out. Uh, not every video, because I don't always remember, but I did on this one. And Alex Berry and Philip Walsh wanted a special shout out. So they got one. There you go. See? So you can join my Patreon too. And, uh, and there you go. So those are all those people. You can pause and read the names. Some funny names on here, you know? There's a French name on there. There's a the Serbian name on there. Check it out. All right. Anyway, did you like this uh, analysis? Have you thought about Diogenes? You should. Do you also drink black coffee? I do. Black coffee's great because it never goes bad. You can drink it a week later. Okay, until next time, there's the camera.